thank you for your patience and uh, want to welcome you to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the moderator for the event and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap with some really interesting information, but before we get started, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, just know you'll be able to listen to it on demand later on. We'll be sending out an email post-event that contains a link to take you right to the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time you have a question for either of our panelists, Please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question and we'll take about 15 minutes or so near the end of the presentation and go through those audience questions. Okay, with that, we'd like to go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is yes, Virginia, automatic monitoring does exist. Our speakers today are Pete Abrams, who is the co-founder and COO of Instana, and Bernd, uh, or Bernd Herzog, who is CEO of APM Experts. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, thank you. Uh, right. Oh, thanks. Yeah, great. So, Pete, I know you are kicking things off, so I'm going to put myself on mute and let you get to it. Great, thank you. And uh, what I will do, folks, is um, um, just introduce this topic, essentially, and get Bernd going because really the key uh, the key topic today is the research that bernd has been doing about um, you know the real differences between automatic and manual approaches to um, you know monitoring uh, applications. So wanted to just jump in, Oops, click, click. There we go. Um, you know, and 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 give you a, a review of what we see in the marketplace, which I'm sure almost everyone here is intimately familiar with. As we engage uh, with the marketplace, um, here's the commonality. Here's what we see across the whole industry. It's all about speed, right? People have figured out the faster they can create new business services, the more business value you know they create for their for their company. Um, and uh, probably the most common theme or maybe technique is the CI/CD concept, right? The idea of just building software as fast as possible and where Instana sits in that and the way we position our company is, um, you know, automate that last stage, right? You, you know, you pop it into production using all kinds of automated techniques. Uh, but, uh, but there's no simple way to just absolutely no touch, get the feedback you need uh, to operate with quality and then start understanding your code so you can go back into the planning stage, right? So automation is used everywhere. But it's never been really available um, as a uh, solution for, for monitoring. And that's our, that's our positioning, and, and we'll come back to that at the end. We're going to give you a demo as to uh, you know, what automatic monitoring really means to us and really show it to you. Um, you know, it's a very brave new world. Uh, lots of talk about uh, containers, um, microservice architecture, the microservice approach, the agile and CI CD model. But essentially, what's happened? is uh, you know, we've ended up in a place that's very different from five years ago. Uh, we have a much more disintegrated, is a word I like to use, uh, and distributed environment. You know, the real work happens now by sending lots of messages between microservices. The word micro is quite appropriate there, right? Essentially APIs, each of them clustered and in a, you know, in a, and by the way, in a state of continuous evolution in their own right, and that's where CI/CD comes in, right? Developers um, are constantly improving or even adding uh, new microservices uh, using that CI/CD uh, technique. This is an extremely dynamic environment. It's quite common for us to see customers with, in small environments, a hundred. Uh, microservices, APIs, services, whatever, you know, there's no common term, but microservices seems to be correct. Um, and then, uh, you know, even up to 500, 800 uh, with, you know, thousands of components underneath that. That's a challenge, you know, traditional monitoring, much less APM, application performance monitoring, was never designed for that. And, 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 it's, and it's struggling uh, to provide the visibility needed. Now enter, excuse me, Come on, there we go, click. Um, 
you know, the open source community has responded to that. They see the same problem. They experience the same problem. That's where Prometheus has come in. Uh, there's certainly, you know, many previous uh, monitoring capabilities back, you know, going backwards. But Prometheus is the most modern approach. You know, really connecting into, uh, you know, Kubernetes and the and the whole containerized world. It is a um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's become quite popular, um, and alongside of that. Uh, two new approaches to collecting traces, right? If you if you want to understand how uh, you know uh, that work is being done across all of those microservices, you have to have some kind of visibility into the messages, and that's what Jaeger, Zipkin, and then uh, Open Tracing alongside of that are all about, right? Is enabling that um, you know collecting that kind of data. Those are data sets that can then be pulled into Prometheus. And then a fair amount of work has to happen beyond that to uh, you know really get information out of it. So um, these approaches are be you know are are, are pro proliferating. Uh, they're you know th they can be made to work. Uh, what we have noticed in larger scale, um, uh, you know, it really starts to be a challenge, and that's where Instana comes in. So now let me introduce our speaker and, and give a little context before he starts. We saw this main difference between the manual approach, which you know Prometheus and the Zipkin approach or, 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 or Jaeger approach is quite a by hand approach to collecting data and, and, and uh, building it into performance information. And we kind of said, huh, let's really try to document what these differences are. Uh, we know Bernd for many years uh, in the APM space. He's been an analyst uh, covering the world of APM for quite a while, you know, uh, since the early days of the APM world in the early in the early 2000s, and we said, why don't we get an independent thinker, you know, to come in and really analyze these differences? And that's where Bert comes in. Let me introduce Mr. Herzog. Go ahead, Bert. I'm going to change presenter to you. There you go. You got that. I got it. Thank you, sir. Um, and hopefully you can all see my screen. Yep. Uh, great. So, you know, you, you get the answer up front with me, right? So they asked me to take a look and, and the answer is that, and I'll go through the details as to why, you know, if, if your goal is to go fast, then open source monitoring is a terrible idea. And I'll, I'll walk you through the rationale behind that. Um, a little bit more about my background. I've I spent, you know, a good uh, 25 years or so bringing products to market, um, have some patents and self-learning performance analytics, have been a CEO twice, um, found, you know, founded companies and sold them, um, and then spent um, a good bit of time the last 13 years um, as a product strategy consultant and an industry analyst. Um, in under NDA with essentially most of the new monitoring industry, ranging from the application layer um, down into the infrastructure, uh, deep into the infrastructure with people like Intel and VMware's clients. And I've also helped some pretty big companies um, make their APM decisions essentially. So people have come to me sometimes and said, hey, we don't know how to evaluate these solutions. Can you help us? And so I've done that several times as well. So I've really been involved in this industry at a, a level of depth that I don't think very many other people, if any other people have ever been involved in it. Um, and what I see right now is that you know, the thing, the business thing, and Pete alluded to it, that is driving a lot of the behavior in this industry is this thing called digital transformation or digitization. Right? And what that simply means is implementing your key business processes in software, um, implementing all of them in software, implementing them in software as quickly as possible, um, and then evolving them as rapidly as possible. Right? And what it basically means is that every enterprise really is a software company. If you think about how a software company competes, a software company competes by evolving their software as quickly as possible in response to competitive pressures and customer demands, right? Well, that's now what every enterprise has to do is they have to evolve their software in response to customer requirements and competitive pressures. Um, and 
collectively, when you add up the, pre the pressure of essentially every company in the world who is implementing software, implementing their business processes and software, right? If everybody's doing this at the same time, then that collectively creates a set of pressures um, upon the industry, right? Because this is now something the industry has to respond to. This is my God, now every company in the world is a software development company. Every company in the world is a product company online, right? So what, how does the industry respond to this? Well, it responds with a set of innovations. Uh, the first innovation is a shift in application architecture from monolithic and SOA architectures to microservice architectures. It responds with a pro process innovations, agile, DevOps, and now CICD, which are processes designed to allow you to streamline the process of getting code into production. More languages to, so that there is a language that, for every purpose. Um, so you don't push, put a square peg in a round hole. Um, you know, there are languages for low level work and languages for big data work and languages for standard, you know, business process work, um, et cetera, right? But that leads to some diversity, many different ways to run applications. So a tremendous amount of innovation going on in making it easier for you to run applications in production and take take work out of the hands of developers who have to support applications in production. Um, you know, things like OpenShift and Kubernetes being the most recent examples of these things, right? Great proliferation in the data architectures. It's not just a MySQL, you know, Microsoft SQL world anymore. Um, there's the whole Hadoop big data stack and then lots of other kinds of innovations going on at the big data layer. Of, of course, now everything is virtualized. Um, it's almost like physical network compute and storage hardware doesn't exist anymore. You, you don't get to touch it anymore. And then of course it's, it's split across, it's run on many different clouds. So collectively, this means that we as an industry are in a place where I've never, in my experience, seen us be, right? And I've been in the industry since 1980. Uh, and that is in a, a place where there is an unprecedented level of innovation that's continuing to go on. There's an unprecedented level of diversity in the stack. Um, there's an unprecedented level of dynamic behavior across the stack, right? There's dynamic behavior at the application layer as new things get released every day. Um, and there's dynamic behavior in the infrastructure as things are spun up and down based upon various triggers, right? And then of course the level of the level of virtualization and the level, number of layers of, of abstraction keep increasing, right? If you if you look at this stack and you go, okay, how many layers of abstraction are there? Well, okay, there's a layer for compute, network, and storage. That's a hypervisor, right? Okay, then you could say that you know, Docker is a layer and Kubernetes is a layer um, and a service mesh like Istio is a layer, right? And then the runtime for the JVM or the runtime for the application is a layer. So you have four or five, six layers of abstraction between the code and the metal. So collectively these things, right? The, the pace of innovation, the diversity, the dynamic behavior, the layers of abstraction, create an environment that is much more difficult to manage than anything we've seen before. Um, and it's a real challenge for the monitoring industry. Um, and, and it's quite frankly why I work with leading vendors in this space. Now, you know, let's talk about manual monitoring and you know things you should try to avoid having happen. So the first of these, and we're gonna, dr we're gonna drill really deeply into the first three here is, um, if you have to spend time instrumenting your code for metrics, then that gets in the way of, of rapid delivery into production. If you have to spend time instrumenting for tracing, and we're gonna quantify this, that gets in the way. If you have to manually develop dashboards and thresholds, right? So in a few minutes, we're gonna go deeply into the economic consequences and the business consequences of these first three. And then there are other things that sometimes require manual effort in the world of monitoring, like installing agents and application runtimes is not a good idea in the world of microservices. Um, you know, manually having to update agents when there's new versions 
of agents and having to take things down in order to update the agents is not a good idea. It slows you down. Having to manually configure and identify, name, manually type in application names and transaction names and names of microservices, all this stuff changes way too fast. Um, manually setting thresholds for alerts and alarms. So, so huge time sink, right? And then finally, you know, manually creating and maintaining a backend, or in some cases, we'll talk about that in a second, multiple backends for a monitoring system. So the, the approach that I took when Instana came to me is I said, look, I don't want to get into a technical conversation here because you know people who believe that open source monitoring is a good thing or believe it's a good technical approach. And I didn't want to get into an, a, you know, a hand grenade throwing contest over the technical merits of that versus the technical merits of a product like Instana. I took the approach of saying, look, let's look at the cost, right? And let's look at the cost in terms of the time of having to do things in an, with an open source set of tools um, versus the time to do things with you know, a product that's built for this scenario like Instana. Um, so, you know, what are the requirements that we want these approaches to meet, right? So the first requirement is, well, given how, fa how fast things are changing, we need to collect data in real time, one second. We need to have instant visibility into how fast things are going, how quickly things are going wrong. Um, and by the way, al along with that requirement comes a deluge of data and the requirement to be able to process that data in a, in, a, in a low latency big data backend, which is something that not many, many monitoring products can do. Right? You need to s discover microservices and services and applications automatically. If you have to take the time to manually write code every time you create a microservice, you've slowed yourself down. You, know, you want to automatically inject instrumentation. You, you don't want to be installing stuff in microservices. You want the monitoring system to inject the metric instrumentation and the tracing appropriate to the language and runtime that the, the service is written in and using. Okay. Um, Knowing what is running where, knowing what is talking to what, knowing what is a member of what is essential if you want to have any hope of doing root cause. Um, one, one of the most conspicuous failures in this industry in the last 20 years has been the complete failure of the CMDB. That's almost an entire another topic we should get into, right? Because the CMD fa failed because it, it, it can't be kept up to date. And so you can't rely upon a CMDB to know how your microservices are mapped into your infrastructure because a CMDB would never know that to be accurate at this moment in time. So it's up now to first class monitoring approaches to know that. And then you need to have, you know, continuous real time anomaly detection, you know, that's automatic and that keeps up. So as soon as something goes wrong, you get told. Now, what do we look at? What did I look at here? I looked at Prometheus, which is a cloud native compute foundation project, right, as a metric collection approach. Um, and so Prometheus can collect, you know, rate metrics, which is a measure of throughput. It can collect errors. It can collect duration, which is performance. And of course, you have to write code um, to collect that stuff and feed it into Prometheus, and then you can get alerts and, you know, you can get visualizations in the Prometheus templates or Grafana. Um, Jaeger is an open source tracing solution that's built on the open tracing um, you know, standard essentially for open source tracing. And you can, a developer can instrument their code for traces, instrument each of the endpoints in the microservices. And then every time a microservice makes a call to some other microservice that results in a trace, um, and end-to-end -end traces um, end up in a database, and the database is either an instance of Elasticsearch or a, a Cassandra cluster, and then you can build dashboards. And then, of course, Instana is a product that solves this problem comprehensively, right? And we're going to go into some of those differences in a few minutes. So if you compare the functionality 
um, just for a moment of Instana versus the two open source approaches. Right? So yeah, they can collect data, they can do tracing, and they can do that with high granularity. Um, but Instana can discover these services automatically and the open source approaches require you to write code when there's a new service. Okay. The Instana can inject the instrumentation, the open source approaches require you to write the code to provide the instrumentation. Okay. Uh, Instana will automatically map things that talk to each other into the infrastructure where things run. The open source approaches will tell you what is talking to what, but contain no mapping into where things are running, which makes an entire class of root cause impossible. Um, Instana includes the AI to automate the alerting. It automatically learns what is normal and then alerts you on deviations from normal. Um, and that entire set of functionality is missing from Prometheus and Jaeger, which leads to the lack of missing root cause analysis. And finally, you know, Prometheus and Jaeger are two different things. And you end up with two different sets of data, and two different sets of systems for dashboards and alerts, as opposed to one. Okay, so that leads to some important gaps here, right? Um, with the open source approach, you have to manually instrument the code for metrics and tracing. You know, Jaeger, on, again, only traces the flows, what talks to what, doesn't have the what runs where and what is a member of what mapping, right? Again, they end up in two different databases and you have to manually manage thresholds. And you know, that can be a real challenge if you have things like time of day and day of week behavior in your data, which most folks do, right? Normal at two o'clock in the afternoon is very different than normal at midnight. So this is the detail on the cost. So what we did and we, we proposed, we, I created the model and then we due diligence the model with some customers. We went to the customers and said, look, you know, can we walk you through the model um, and can you tell us whether or not, quite frankly, this is reasonable or, or this is BS, right? Um, and the, the result was we were able to, to effectively prove that this model was realistic um, by talking to four different customers across four very different kinds of applications and very different sizes of environments. So let's look at the columns here and I'll explain to you what, what we did. So first of all, to collect metrics. The very first thing you have to do um, at the very start is write code for Prometheus for each microservice. Right? So you have to do work for each microservice that you have to collect metrics. And then of course the cost of doing that depends upon the number of microservices you have. Right? Now then, every time you update, every time you do a new release to that microservice, you have to at the minimum know that your check that your monitoring is still working. If you've changed the functionality of your microservice, you might have to change the functionality of your monitoring to, to, to match it up with the change that you just made. And this is a function, of course, of how much time it takes you to, to, to check that and the number of times you release a day. Um, you know, there's, there's, we've, I spoke to customers that release six times a day and they release 40 times a day. Um, so, you know, the amount of effort that you put into checking it every time and the number of times you release a day essentially determines the, this, this, this third column here. And then for tracing, it's, a, it's the same pattern. How much time do you write, the, how does it take to write the code? And therefore, what is the cost of that time to Im implement tracing, right? And then, you know, okay, every time we release, we're going to have to check to see that our tracing code still works and maybe update that tracing code because we've put a new endpoint into that microservice and we have to manually write the code to instrument the tracing for that new endpoint. Okay. Same thing for dashboarding and thresholding, right? I've got to do this now in two places. I have to do this in Prometheus and in Jaeger. I've got to create the dashboards and thresholds um, initially for all of my microservices, and then I have to update them, update that cost. And, um, and by the way, this is all done in a spreadsheet, and it's all highly it's all highly configurable, so you can 
you know, basically go into the spreadsheet and put in your own numbers and put in your own cost and, and it all just kind of comes out at the end and gives you the answer. Right, so all this works out too. So here's, here's oh yeah, the OPEX cost to monitor the environment, which is stand up the servers and run the servers, the, the Cassandra cluster and whatever else you need. So then that results in the total, year, the total cost to initially set things up, depending on the number of microservices you have, the yearly cost to update things. And then for five years, it's just this, okay, and then you know five years of update costs all added up. Right? So the, the the short answer is that while you don't pay any licensing fees for the open source approach to this, you do pay dearly in terms of the time of the developers required to set this up and maintain it. So what are the business implications of this? Uh, first of all. Um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of things going on in the IT industry. Um, not all of them rise to the level of being business issues. This one rises to the level of being a business issue. Digitization is a board level conversation in most companies. How are we competing online? Okay, how, how are we doing relative to our competitors with delivering our products and services online over the internet and over mobile applications, right? Um, so doing that well is a top line business issue it's an issue that uh, involves revenue it involves company reputation it involves retention of customers so it ha it something that has to be done well um, if you choose to do this in open source tools you're going to divert some of your talented and experienced people from evolving your business functionality to building monitoring and consuming these people's time in every release, right, it's going to slow down your agility. You're going to remove resource from delivering applications into production quickly to doing to building monitoring, and therefore slow yourself down. Right now, and that's just the first level of cost. The second level of cost is well, okay. So I took these people off of building monitor off of building business functionality. Well, the cost of doing that is the opportunity cost of what they could have done in the application that drives my revenue, right? So if you took the, that team of a half a dozen people and said, no, don't build monitoring, build functionality that drives revenue, market share, that reduces costs, that improves customer satisfaction, then you get a, you get a business benefit from that, right? that is different and obviously is not, you're not gonna get if you divert those folks to build monitoring, right? So in, in summary, it's just not a good business decision to take the, the talented people that it would require to build and maintain an open source monitoring system um, and have them go try to build monitoring when what they could do is improve the competitive position of your company online instead. Okay, so um, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, give it back to Pete here. Um, so here we go, Pete, and it's yours. Great, thank you, Bernd. Um, I did see a question go by and we will get to that. Let me set up our next phase, um, which is uh, showing you actually automatic monitoring. Um, so what I'll do quickly is, um, you know, remind us that, you know, here's, here's the situation at, at hand, right? Extremely dynamic, continuously changing structure. What I mean by that is, you know, any one of the layers on the left, the host layer, container layer, the set of middleware in play, the, you know, the clustering of any particular service, then the code, you know, presenting the service is really in a state of, continuous evolution. And, and by the way, if I were to explain, you know, wh wh why did we start Instana is because four and a half years ago, we saw this, right? We saw this starting to come to, to you know, come to bear, if you will. Um, I was in, you know, uh, I've been in monitoring uh, companies uh, for the last uh, tw 12 years, as, as, as for all the other uh, co-founders. And 
we saw any any customer that was kind of going down this architectural and procedural path uh, was really having challenges. And you know, all monitoring in history has essentially been designed around a relatively static model. You know, the idea that hey, I'm going to deploy my software onto this server and it's going to stay there for you know probably three years or at least six months anyway. Um, and uh, and so you know the previous generation of techniques was was fine, right? Uh, it wasn't wrong. It was it was just designed for that use case. This is a completely different use case. So how do we attack this? And that's what we have, uh, you know, that's what we have done. So so Bert just went through this in detail. I don't need to remind us, but it's quite a manual process. Here's our approach. All right. So um, you know, down there on the bottom is is all your hosts. We've got to collect data from something, and it's got to be as minimal amount of effort as absolutely possible. So our one ask, get our agent into that host. Lots of techniques for doing that, including, you know, using containers as a, you know, using even Kubernetes as your, shall we say, you know, agent deployment mechanism. And Steve uh, will actually demonstrate this in a few seconds. Once that agent is in play, the rest is truly automatic. Uh, you know, what is the set of pieces running on that host, whether they're in containers or not? Um, you know, let's connect to that. Let's let's discover them, understand them, connect to them, and start collecting metrics automatically. And uh, and you know, organizing those metrics in a way that'll allow us to uh, do a good job. So one agent deployed per host. Uh, it continuously discovers all of essentially the technology in play there. Uh, collects metrics from all those components automatically and then starts tracing when it sees something like a Java or a Python or a .NET server or, you know, the application layer technology, shall we say, also connects to those and begins tracing and also builds a dependency map, which is really the key to enabling uh, uh, really automated root cause analysis. Um, oh, one second. We have to do this automatically. Don't slow down. <laughs> Let the robot do the work. That explains why we have this, uh, you know, sort of futuristic looking guy we call Stan, short for Instana. Um, you know, it, it, he signifies really two things. Automation, you know, that's, robots are good at repetitive tasks, uh, but also intelligence, right? Because we do do a lot of uh, analysis as to what the data means and try to give you indicator as to uh, real quality. So with that, that's all I wanted to do is set that up quickly. Uh, let me turn this over to Steve, the organizer. There you are, Steve. Steve Waterworth has been uh, with Instana for close to two years now, also a long history in the APM world um, and quite an expert in understanding really the use cases of performance monitoring. Go ahead, Steve, thank you. Hi there. So what we have here is the Instana dashboard, and you'll notice at the moment it's conspicuously blank. This is because we haven't installed the agent. We do have an application running. We have Stan's Robot Shop, which is uh, available. It's our free sample microservices application. If you ever want to have a play with it, it's freely available there on GitHub. So what we would need to do is install the agent. So we go to our management portal and we have an install agent option here, and we have various options to install that agent, um, and there's, and there's um, chef recipes and Ansible and so on and so forth. There's all those different deployment mechanisms. Currently, I'm running Stan's Robot Shop just in a Docker environment, so we can use this Docker command here, which we could just copy onto the clipboard and paste into our command prompt. So if I close that out and then I have here, I've done that already. I created a little, little shell script for it. So there's our Docker run command with all the things in it. And then at the end there, I start tailing the logs. So if I just run that, so our agent's now been kicked off inside that Docker container that is also running Stan's robot shop. And what we're seeing here is the tail of the log of the agent. So it's firing up and then it's going to start its auto discover. And as it discovers 
different technologies that are deployed in that stack. It's going to dynamically pull in what we call a sensor, which is sort of like a lightweight agent. It's going to dynamically pull in the appropriate sensor for that technology, and that sensor actually does the work then of monitoring that piece of technology. So that's what we're going to start pulling through. If I just put that into live mode, we should get some uh, live updates as it comes through. This will take it a minute or two, which is maybe uh, a little bit of dead air, but it's going to be a damn sight quicker than if you sat and watched me manually go through all the source for Stan's robot shop and for every endpoint put in Prometheus coding and uh, Jaeger coding to capture traces and capture various metrics. So it's starting to pull that through now. We can see the various different plugins being pulled in as it's discovering various different technologies that make up Stan's robot shop. Demo gods be good to me. That's all I can say. This is live. We're doing it for real. Steve, my fingers are crossed. <laughs> my everything is crossed. Is that helping? <laughs> so, yeah, there's various sensors all been activated there. We should start to see the uh, first bit. So, yeah, just about everything's all is done dynamically. There's a couple of runtimes that uh, like Go being the being the particularly tricky one because that's a compiled binary. So you do have to make a, a few small tweaks to the source to get that to work. But all the other agents all happen automatically. So there in the background, the, uh, the, the, the discovery started, the data started to flowing, and the dashboard has updated. So we can see, if we just zoom in a little bit further, there we go. So we can see now we've got our stack, which is all of Stan's robot shop with the various different technologies there that have been all automatically discovered. The data started to tick in. So if I go to the full dashboard on that, we've got our host data, and we can see we've got our CPU data all starting to tick in now. And then we have various different components here that make up the shop. So let's take a, a look at one of those components. This is a Node.js component. So again, we're starting to get all that data coming in about the language runtime. Over on the other tab here on the applications, we have our services. So these are all automatically discovered. So these are the services and then the endpoints within those services. So we take a look at our catalog service. Again, this is this data is, is coming from the tracing data. So as the traces come in, we're analyzing those traces in real time and giving us the, the, the RED, the, the rate, errors, and duration key KPIs for that. We can see the different endpoints again all this has all been automatically discovered i haven't had to do any work to get this level of data and again for each endpoint we get the same level of data and and steve if i could just interject for a second i think that that last sentence there you, you seriously you really didn't have to do anything all you did is start the agent that's it and, and just fire the agent up and away it goes. Now there is some load running on that application, right? That was generating some, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. there's load generation against the application so we right. can so we can see the data, yeah. And folks, this is this, you know, okay, again, let's go back to that comparison point, right? You know, and this is the reason why we wanted to get Burnt involved with, you know, really helping us understand, okay, you can talk about this technically. Uh, you know, but I mean, at the end of the day, we, you know, we got all the metrics, we understand quality um, and all that happened automatically. Let's, let's, let's think about this in terms of costs, right? Like, you know, how much effort was that versus, you know, having your core uh, developers mess with this, right? Whole bunch of questions coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and fire off a couple, Steve, and then I'll let you get back to your flow. Um, how about Kafka? Can we um, watch, or sorry, can we monitor data flowing through Kafka top topics? Yeah, we we support Kafka. The easiest thing to do is go to our web, oops, that's the wrong one. That's somebody else I've been working with. It's what autofill getting, the, getting the, ahead of me though. Uh, 
Uh, you see, if I could only type, it'd make this job so much easier. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Hey, so if we go to the documentation page, then we have all the technologies that we support. Kafka is a supported technology, and it'll tell you everything that we collect for Kafka. And of course, the best way to do it, if you've got a Kafka install and you want to know what Instana will do for you, just sign up for a free, free trial and have a play with it. And uh, that's actually one of the next, uh, there's a couple questions around that. Um, you know, uh, just maybe you could indicate the, um, go back to our website and indicate the, the trial. Um, we do not have a community edition or a free edition, but we have a free trial. Um, we are glad to give you two weeks and then, and, you know, and then let you, that should be enough time for you to really engage with it and start playing with it. Um, if you want more time, no problem. Just engage with our sales guys. They'll help you extend that trial a bit and, and understand how it can uh, work. Um, and yes, this recording will be made available later. Uh, there's a question on licensing model. Great question. That's um, essentially we do it, uh, you know, per host per year, right? There's the pricing page right there. Um, uh, per host per year, um, Steve is showing you in GBP, we have, uh, depending on your territory, we're price in dollars or pounds or uh, euro, also yen. Um, and essentially it's, it's uh, per host per year, we indicate it per month there, um, kind of model <laughs> with, um, you know, we sort of don't care what's on the host. Um, we do have some limits, you know, we don't want, uh, a host with a thousand containers on there so we have some limits around that but it's all pretty reasonable we've priced very aggressively compared to the rest of the world um someone asked the question um about uh comparing between us and app dynamics um couple things well first of all uh price is a big one uh that has a reputation for being quite pricey um Overhead, uh, dramatically less overhead because we really only have one agent per host, whereas AppDynamics has very many, you know, as many components you have on your machine as as many agents you have. So they have a real overhead challenge, um, which makes it, you know, and then the rest, the other part of the story, I would say that, and I'll hand it back to you to answer, Steve, is is automatic. I mean, what you witnessed is just completely impossible with AppDynamics, um, you know, and 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 really the rest of the whole uh, monitoring world. Uh, go ahead, Steve, how would you, what other things? Yeah, you... also just on a little, on the on the more technical aspects, it's the resolution of the data. So we, Stana collects data at a one second granularity, uh, which is, and holds on to that one second granularity for quite a long time. Off the top of my head, I can't remember the retention period. And also we trace every single request. There is There isn't any sampling on that on the on the tracing whereas app dynamics snapshots uh, a limited amount compared to the request volume exactly correct and, and that actually leads into another question um show me some you know sort of code level visibility um you know and maybe highlight a little bit more around you know analyzing the traces go ahead so yeah we we take a look at a i haven't i picked this one because i know it's quite it has quite a nice trace behind it so uh, let's have a look with a uh, second and a bit. So we get uh, we can get from a from a service or from an endpoint very easily to traces that are calling that, and then we have the level of detail here where we can see what's calling what when. Oops, there we go. Demo gods not working so kindly for me today. Let's pick a different trace. I don't know why that one's not uh, not working for me today. Oh no, okay. For some reason, demo gods have uh, have stopped. Uh, are not are not playing today. So uh, you're in live mode, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's always. Yeah, it shouldn't. Right. That shouldn't. In, it shouldn't impact it. That should work. When I highlight one of these guys, we should get no. For some reason, this one is not not working at the moment you can you can tell it's a live demo and not just a series of screenshots <laughs> um, um let me, let me try add to that, if, if you have invested into uh you know open tracing or jaeger um um 
or even Zipkin for that matter, um, and we do see that quite often, uh, great, we can subsume or you know ingest um, those traces uh, extremely easily and kind of sew mm -hmm. them alongside um, our own automatic traces. And let me highlight, you know, no code was written to see the tracing that you're seeing now. Yeah, yeah. So this is Node.js app. So this is just all, uh, all automatically done, and you can see it's it's going out and it's calling Redis. And we should, if I when I click on one of these, if the demo gods were being kind to me, uh, I should see um, call stacks and the more de more detail on that. Um, but there you go. No, the here's demo a god is frowning on me, having having been very kind to me when the when the uh, when, when he when he showed you everything out of magic. So um, here's a here's a great question, and this basically also alludes to um, you know machine intelligence applied to all this all this data. Now Steve did mention that every request through the system will you know result in a trace being captured by Instana. Does this solution set thresholds automatically? Great question, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. El, El Khalifa. Well, <laughs> yes, there's various different technologies that uh, that work to provide a degree of automatic monitoring. So, the if you want ultimate control, yes, you can create custom rules and say, hey, trigger when this value is greater than this, which is what you would do with traditional monitoring solutions but we have a, a whole different set of, of AI technologies running in the background analyzing this data so one of the technologies for example is is edge detection so if we see a sudden increase in response time or a sudden increase in the number of errors then that's going to automatically trigger an alert to say hey you've had a, a sudden spike here uh, that's uh, that might be something you want to investigate. Similarly, a sudden drop in request volume and the number of calls to a particular service or endpoint that's also going to trigger an alert. And then we're using neural neural nets, and we can then alert against abnormality. So a good example would be, say, Monday morning you would normally get 200 logins an hour. This Monday morning you're only getting 20 logins an hour they're all going through perfectly but there's only 20 of them the request volume is a lot lower than normal so that would again trigger an alert saying this metric is not normal for this particular time so and that's all that's done with machine learning so there's various different technologies in there that are providing uh, automatic alerting also there's a curated knowledge base so for all the standard stuff all the all, all the boring drudgery stuff that you'd have to set up by hand things like my garbage collection's a bit high on Java, or my event loop on Node.js is too long, or my oh, hit miss ratio on my Redis cache is not is too low. Then all that all that is all that data, all those all those rules are already pre-programmed into Instana, so you haven't got to manually create all that. All that there's a core set of implicit knowledge in Instana ready to go. Nice, nice. Okay, so a couple more great questions, folks. Thank you. Um, if we create custom metrics, in other words, sort of build, you know, something on my own of interest for for any reason, is there a way to push that into uh, Instana? Yeah. So the Instana agent supports a StatD interface, which is probably like the easiest way of getting information in there. You can do that from well from a shell script up. So uh, yeah, very easy to get extra metrics in if you want. So things that already support metric frameworks like JMX and I think um, Drop Wizard does, and there's probably a few others that I can't remember off the top of my head. The agent already knows about those frameworks and can be configured to suck those metrics in. And those end up being, a, so then those get visualized where, Steve? Where, where would you actually end up seeing them? Yeah, I don't have any of those in the demo, so I can't show it. But yes, they they come through on the infrastructure side of side of things. So if I went into my host, for example, and went to a went to a JVM, if I had configured collection for extra JMX data, mm. it would appear within this pane. Got it. And I think right. an extra 
can't remember where the tab appears now. You get an extra tab in here with all the JMX data. And then those metrics, they're, they're, they're treated exactly the same as all the other metrics. You know, there, right. are, there is no difference. So again, we can alert on deviation on, on abnormalities on those metrics. Another great question. What kind of access rights do we need to run an install agent? So the Instana agent in depends which, yeah, depends which platform. Um, so in Docker, it actually runs as, does need to run as a privileged container in order to do that auto discovery. It needs to be able to get out of its little out of its little sandbox. Typically on a Linux box, it's going it's going to need root privileges again to do that auto discovery. It needs to be able to go and find out what's running and inspect those programs that are running. I'm speechless. <laughs> I, think I, saw, I think I saw a question go by earlier about Grafana. There is Did a, you? The, go ahead. Yeah, well, is, good, uh, pretend okay. I asked it. Go ahead. It, it whizzed past earlier on. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Instana, Instana does have a Grafana data source. So if you're already using Grafana for some, for some of your dashboards and you want to get Instana data in there, there's an Instana data, data source in the Grafana app store you can just install that into your Grafana, configure up that data source and start pulling in Instana metrics and have Grafana goodness. Steve, why don't you do one more, just quick, uh, click onto our website. Um, you know, we encourage you to um, uh, come on down and uh, click on free trial, try it. It's really ridiculously easy. Um, you will have your own environment. It takes us about 10 minutes to spin it up. Um, after you click on that, fill in a few things, and uh, you'll be on your way. Um, and, yeah, then, and, if you, uh, and if you don't have a microservices app, you you can always just uh, cl clone in uh, the robot shop, and that'll that'll spin up on on quite a small host. I'm running it in yeah, Amazon right. on the T2 medium. You can Google search for a uh, sample microservice app, or it's right there, Steve. Click on your GitHub there again. There it is. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we posted that, the, the one that you've been looking, uh, because we found out that there's not many microservice apps around, you know, that, you know, just as a platform to play with, a thing to mess around with. So um, we posted that. We built it and posted it up. Um, let's see, a couple more. How does it? How does Instana work for, you know, big data applications? You know, how, how can we help uh, with someone who's got a big, you know, a, a, a big Elastic or Cassandra implementation? Yeah, well, both both of those technologies are supported, so we're going to again monitor those, monitor the health of those clusters, and uh, report how well they're performing or not, and. Also, the um, the health of the I don't remember the different technologies now. The health of the shards uh, that uh, that make that cluster up, and we also um, report against the queries. So if we take a look at uh, here, I I don't have any of the big ones because it has to run in a small environment. But we've got some Mongo here. So this is. Now looking at at the at a service, but this service is a data service. It's a it's a data store. It's a MongoDB, and we can take a look at the performance. And the performance here, sort of the endpoints are actually the queries. And it's pretty lightly loaded, so not much happens. But yeah, these are the this is the performance. So again, for those uh, both SQL and NoSQL data stores, we will automatically monitor those. Uh, as endpoints and see yeah. the performance, see the performance of the queries as well as the health of the infrastructure that that makes that up. Yeah, beautiful. And another good one. What's the minimum infrastructure and service environment needed to try Instana? So let me start by saying when you hit um, free trial, it's a SaaS service. So on the back end, nothing. You just need to get the agent into play. Um, and you know, point that agent back to our SaaS service, and that's it. Uh, but on the overhead side, I'll go. I'll let you uh, take that, Steve. Go ahead. Yeah, the overhead's uh, very low. The the Instana agent 
um, just binds to a single core on a machine. So it's only ever going to impact one core. And the overhead on that is uh, is typically in the low percentages, sort of two, three, four, five percent. Then this is always, of course, a certain amount of it all depends. But it's generally generally around there. We also do a lot of uh, data optimization. So when we're sending metrics back, for example, we only send the difference. So for metrics that don't change so often, like uh, oh, how full a file system is, and it's 20%, and the last sample it was 20%, so no data is, is sent. So, and also the data stream's compressed, so the network overhead is very light as well. If you want to run, say, if you want to run Stan's Robot Shop as your microservices application, so I'm running that on EC2 as a T2 medium, which is pretty light. Or if you've got a decent developer's uh, laptop, you can spin up VMware with uh, a couple of CPUs and a couple of gigs of memory and running a Linux image, and you're good to go. Hey guys, this is Charlene. I'm jumping in now. Um, thanks for taking over the questions. I, I appreciate that, Pete. Um, but I do want to let you guys know we're about two, two minutes to the top of the hour, so we are going to have to close it out for questions now. I want to remind the audience that if we did not get to your question, the folks at Instana will be receiving a copy of all of the questions. So I'm sure somebody from the organization will be happy to uh, get in touch with you uh, offline and answer any questions that you have. Also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you will be able to listen to it on demand. Um, we also invite you to listen to it on demand. If you just want to listen to it again, that'd be great. Um, you'll be receiving an email uh, this afternoon that will include an email link, uh, a link to the webinar on demand. The webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always check it out there. Just go under webinars on demand and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, you can also check out some of the other webinars that we have both on demand and upcoming. Um, hopefully there'll be one or two that pique your interest. Um, so Pete and Bernd and Steve, thank you all for a great presentation today. Um, lots of good stuff. And uh, I also wanna thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, everybody.